Good evening, folks. Uh, thanks for coming out. When I arrived last night, we were just talking it coming from the airport about the, uh, the venue here, which I figured we'd have a room that seated maybe 50 people or maybe 100 if they were ambitious, only to find out that we have this wonderful auditorium that seats 700. It was booked in anticipation of having a debate or dialogue which can draw a lot more people. And I just want to make clear that, that I suggested and requested as well that we have someone uh, that would represent another point of view so that we could present things side by side. That, that's always the goal. To the extent you present things side by side, get both points out, challenge each other on the accuracy of things, try to understand each other better, it's constructive. That failing, I said, great, I'm happy to give a lecture and then we'll have Q&A as well. So uh, I, I do appreciate you coming. The benefit of this great auditorium here, we've got room for a lot more folks, but the benefit is we have this wonderful screen and we'll, we'll have this all videotaped as well. Uh, my website is askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, that's D-R, and on Facebook, if you want to connect there, it's also Ask Dr. Brown or on Twitter, which I don't do a lot of tweeting, sorry to say. Uh, that's Dr. Michael L. Brown. Uh, I became aware of Israel Apartheid Week events happening on different campuses. My concern was that there would be one side presented and only one side presented, and a side that I would say in many ways would give an unfair picture of Israel. My intent tonight is not to give an unfair picture of anyone else or try to balance one extreme with another, but perhaps to give you a narrative, perhaps to give you a point of view that you don't often hear, sometimes through the media, sometimes through history, uh, history writing, which can often be revisionist, and certainly in a presentation like Israel Apartheid Week. I'm a Jew and I'm a follower of Jesus, which means many Jews like me and many Jews don't like me. So it's not like I am the champion of everything Jewish and uh, as if I would be saying that Israel never makes a mistake. At the same time, I'm a follower of Jesus, which means I believe Jesus loves Arab and Jew, Muslim, Christian, the same in terms of dying for all people and showing his love for all people. What I want to address specifically, though, is this question, is Israel an evil occupier? I'll only be speaking for six or seven hours. No, just kidding. Um, I'll, I'll talk, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, maybe. I've got everything on PowerPoint so that we can cover as much ground as possible. And, and if, if I'm saying something and you're really into it, you don't need to shout or show your approval or give like four standing ovations. On the flip side, if you really don't like what I'm saying, body language is fine. You can be hostile, you can, you can grind your teeth if you're mad at me, but the best thing is to ask a question at the end, all right? That, that's the very best thing. So if you feel anything is inaccurate, if you feel something needs to be challenged, please, that's why we request it. If no debate, then at least we can have some Q&A. So this is our question. Is Israel an evil occupier? I, I want to put things in perspective. Because talk is cheap. You know, we say one picture is worth a thousand words. This is a map of, of the Middle East and then expand it around into Europe and into Asia and into Northern Africa. And all of the, the countries that are in green are Muslim countries, all the way over to Indonesia, which is actually the most populous Muslim country in the world. Uh, and, and I just want you to see that, that Israel is that little red strip there. When you think of Israel as this evil, dominating, horrific empire bent on world domination, I, I just want you to recognize that's the reality physically. And often through history, the modern state of Israel, the nations surrounding Israel have been quite hostile, and some have large factions that want Israel demolished and destroyed. That's just a reality. Uh, about 200,000 missiles are aimed at Israel at any given time. This is according to a top Israel Defense Forces officer. He just said this on February 2nd. And he added that Iran's ability to obtain nuclear weapons was solely dependent on the will of Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah uh, Ali Khamenei, who has, his folks have won very heavily in recent elections as well. Just to give you perspective, at any given moment, 200,000 missiles aimed at Israel. Also, the strategy being published in Iranian news outlets is that Iran should target Israel's uh, nuclear reactor site in Israel's three major cities, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Haifa, with nuclear bombs. 
This would take out over 60% of Israel's population pretty much instantly. Within nine minutes, Iran's freakishly fast missiles would knock the Jewish population back to post-Holocaust days. Just to give a perspective of what Israel deals with as a reality is Iran has the potential of nuclear warfare against Israel. Uh, one year ago, almost to the day, just about three days off, one year ago, there was a horrific terrorist attack that took place in the Jewish settlement of Itamar, where Rabbi Udi Fogel, 36 years old, his wife Ruth, 35, and children Yoav, 11, Elad, 4, and Hadas, three months old, were murdered in cold blood as they slept. There were some other children in another room that were unseen and survived. 12-year-old daughter came back from a youth event to find her family, Rabbi Yaakov Kohn, a neighbor who entered the house with their 12-year-old daughter who returned from a youth event to find her slaughtered family, told the Ynet website that her two-year-old brother was lying next to his bleeding parents, shaking them with his hands and trying to get them to wake up while crying. The sight in the house was shocking. Now, I would think that an event like this would, would, would garner protests at universities, campuses all over America if justice was an issue, if fairness was an issue. Relatives of the family said they wanted pictures released so people could see what actually happened. The, the rabbi there with the three-month-old, there were many reports that the three-month-old was decapitated. There was another one of the children that was murdered. Uh, many Palestinians expressed their outrage over the murders. To, to kill family, little children, slice up a, a three-month-old baby in cold blood, Many expressed their outrage over the murders, but, but as many as one-third of all Palestinians who were polled approved, while Hamas, the elected leadership in Gaza, praised the murderers, who said they were glad they did what they did, even if it meant the death penalty, and the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, the armed wing of Fatah, the dominant political faction in the West Bank, said it had carried out, quote, the heroic operation in response to the fascist occupation against our people in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. What could generate that level of hatred, animosity, and dehumanizing of other people? Just in January, the Palestinian Mufti, so this is religious leader, Islamic leader of great influence among the Palestinians, he quoted in a public speech some of the Quranic traditions and hadith, the hour of resurrection will not come until you fight the Jews. This was just January. The Jew will hide behind stones or trees. Then the stones or trees will call, oh, Muslim, servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Our war with the descendants of the apes and pigs, meaning Jews, is a war of religion and faith. This was just January. Publicly broadcast speech by the Palestinian Mufti. Uh, there was no widespread Palestinian condemnation of the speech from either Palestinian Muslims or Christians. That's disturbing. I, I read a very strong denunciation of this from a, a Turkish Islamic leader. But I was wondering, where is the denunciation? I, I can assure you, if such a speech took place in Israel from an Israeli leader, religious or otherwise, there would be instant condemnation over the whole country and by Jews all around the world. I, I wonder why there was not a widespread condemnation from the Palestinian communities. It troubles me. Could it be? that there's more to the story about the alleged apartheid state. Could it be that Israeli moms and dads don't enjoy sending all their children off to war, both sons and daughters? These are regular people, Palestinians, Israelis, Jews, Arabs. They are regular people who care about their families. Do you think the average Israeli enjoys the fact that every one of their sons and daughters must fight in the military, mandatory? Do you think they enjoy sending them off to the front lines? Could it be that they don't enjoy spending such a large amount of their budget on defense just to survive? Could it be that there's a reason Israeli soldiers spend a good part of their initial training learning ethics and the importance of protecting the lives of Palestinian civilians? That may seem like a complete myth to you, but just talk to the folks in the military. I've got so many friends that live in Israel, and, and when their kids go into the army, that's the first thing. They, they start talking about ethics. And could it be that Israeli casualties in war could be greatly reduced if not for the extreme measures they take to protect civilians? 
I have many times been contacted by friends whose kids are about to go into the front lines, and they say, please pray. It's very, very dangerous because so many of the terrorists are situated right in the midst of civilian population, and, and their lives, the lives of the Israeli soldiers, will be greatly at risk because they have to do their best not to kill and injure civilians. Interesting for a demonic, evil, apartheid state out for ethnic cleansing and genocide to think like that. Very interesting. June 28, 2004, four-year-old Afik Zahavi Ohayon was killed by Qassam rockets, which landed on the street in front of his nursery school in Sderot. These were launched by Hamas, of course, from Gaza. The Qassam knocked him and his mother down as they were on their way to his school. At the funeral, Itzchik Ohayon, the bereaved father, sobbed. I just wanted him to tell me goodnight, Abba. It wasn't his time to die. Who would launch rockets at a nursery school? All right, somehow we froze here. August 9th, 2001. Jerusalem. This was the bombing of the Sabaros Pizzeria. Best friends Malka Roth, 15, and Mikhail Raziel, 16, and the Shiva Shurder family. Parents Mordecai and Sira, and three children, Raya, 14, Avraham, Yitzchak, 4, and Chemda, 2, were among the 15, including seven children, 15 killed, including seven children, and 130 wounded. After the suicide bombing, Palestinian university students at the Annaja University in the West Bank city of Nablus created an exhibition celebrating the one-year anniversary of the Second Intifada. The exhibit's main attraction was a room-sized reenactment of the bombing at Sabaro. Just remember these things during the Apartheid Week event. Just remember these facts, these truths which you will not hear. And, and search out anything I'm saying every detail we're giving is careful and accurate. Uh, the installation featured broken furniture splattered with fake blood and human body parts. The entrance to the exhibition was illustrated with a mural depicting the bombing. The exhibit was later shut down, actually shortly shut down by Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Why would university students have this on their campus commemorating a suicide bombing that killed 15 people, seven children, Wounded 130. Where were the campus protests, I wonder? According to the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Anti-Defamation League, a total of 1,194 Israelis and foreigners were killed and 7,000 wounded between September 2000 and August 2010 by Palestinian terror attacks, most of them during 2000 to 2005, the second intifada. Palestinians killed 1,074 Israelis and wounded 7,520 between 2000 2005, proportional to population, it is roughly equivalent to 50,000 killed and 300,000 wounded in the United States. Where were the campus protests? Where is the outrage over this? This is intentional murder of civilians, not just attacks on soldiers. Striking, isn't it? Gaza, let's use this as a case in point. Israel captured the Gaza Strip as a result of war with Egypt in 1956. 1994, as a result of the Oslo Accords, Gaza was returned to Palestinian sovereignty, but of course, there were Jews still living there. August 17, 2005, Israel began to evacuate all the Jews from Gaza. So this is thousands and thousands of Jews who have been living there for generations, but many of them for decades established there and helping with the Israeli economy in many ways, as, as you'll see. They were forcefully evacuated. America put great pressure on Israel, and, and the Jews living in Gaza were forcefully evacuated. I mean carried out, I mean dragged out. It was traumatic for the nation, and then just put in tent camps, refugee camps. It was expected to take several weeks to evacuate them all. It took less than one week. Israel and the Palestinians agreed the buildings would be raised, and the army began that process after the residents left. Try this again. A total of 1,700 families were uprooted, 
at a cost of nearly $900 million. This included 166 Israeli farmers who produced $120 million in flowers and produce. Approximately 15% of Israel's agricultural exports originated in Gaza, including 60% of its cherry, tomato, and herb exports. Israel also lost 70% of all its organic produce, which was also grown in Gaza. This is the unconditional withdrawal so that this can be 100% occupied by and governed by Palestinians. And of course, Hamas became the elected governing power in Gaza. What was the response? How was Israel paid back? More than 7,000 missiles rained down on Israel from Hamas terrorists in Gaza, including the one that killed four-year-old Afik Zahavi Ohayon. And when Israel finally went to war, again doing its best to avoid civilian casualties, which the corrected UN report recognized with apologies, there was world outcry against Israel. All right, hang on for a second. Hang on for a second. Israel forcefully evacuates all of its people from Gaza. Traumatic for the nation, as you can imagine. Gives 100% control, then, of the territory. Hamas takes leadership and rains down 7,000 rockets wherever they can shoot them, however far they can go, traumatizing in particular the people of Sderot, who have 15 seconds from when an alarm is sounded to get into a bomb shelter. And when Israel finally says, enough, can you imagine, in any situation here in America, can you imagine if we were being bombed from Mexico, if we were being bombed from Canada, if there was some terrorist enclave, and that's what we're talking about, terrorism, we're not saying all Palestinians are terrorists, God forbid, but there was a terrorist enclave attacking and people being killed, thousands of bombs, and now we went to attack them. It would be outrageous to criticize us, and yet Israel was criticized around the world, including protests all over America for Operation Cast Lead. How dare they do this? Here, protesters in Fort Lauderdale, this is what they were saying at the protest. Murderers, go back to the ovens. You need a big oven. This is outrageous. Los Angeles, long live Hitler, put Jews in ovens. Jews are fossil fuel. These sentiments were widely reported. Where were the campus protests? Where was the outrage over this? Now, let me tell you where things stand today. Oh, and by the way, note that groups like gays and feminists marched against Israel, not Hamas. This was the most interesting thing. Where I live, right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a demonstration against Israel during Operation Cast Lead, and I looked at some of the groups that were involved. There were feminist groups, there were gay and lesbian groups, and they were protesting against Israel. I thought, how utterly ironic, because if they dared, if feminists dared to march down the streets of a city in Gaza, or if, if there was a gay pride event in Gaza, that'd be, that'd be the end of those people, or the end of the parade instantly. And yet, I'm, I'm not proud to say that you've got gay pride events in Jerusalem, that's the reality and that Tel Aviv was recently voted, hands down, the most gay-friendly city in the world. Hands down, it won. And that feminism is alive and well in Israel. Now, it's not to say that those things are virtues, it's simply to say it's bizarre that those were the people protesting against Israel. What's the Israeli response? November 2011, I could go month for month for month for several years. November 2011. Israel brought 5,390 truckloads of goods, including 2,521 truckloads of food products delivered into Gaza from Israel. 3,187 tons of cooking gas were delivered via the Karim Shalom crossing. 1,336 Gaza residents, patients and companions, entered or passed through Israel for medical treatment via Erez crossing. What was the Hamas response? Ten rockets and five mortars were fired at Israel from inside Gaza during this period. No injuries reported. How well, strange for an apartheid state out for ethnic cleansing. Strange that the protests and the outrage is not against groups like Hamas. So you say, okay, the fact is the injustices of the past are so grievous. Israel's horrific treatment of the Palestinians is so off the charts that this is the only outlet they have is to strike back. Well, let's just do a brief historical review. Uh, I want to just give the most salient points here. Obviously, you could have whole uh, university classes lasting for years covering every detail, but I just want to mention a few simple 
points. It is true that there has been a continuous Jewish-Israeli presence in the land for 3,000 years. Now, it doesn't mean that Jewish people or the Israelis have the right to the land. I'm not quoting scripture right now. I've got a Bible up here in case there's a biblically related question, but I'm not hitting you over the head with the Bible and saying God said it's their land and therefore it's their land. I just want to point out from a historical viewpoint that it's actually well over 3,000 years there has been a continuous Israeli-Jewish presence in, in the land. It has been as many as five or six million people. It has been as low as five or 6,000 people. But there has been a continuous presence, a longer pedigree than any other people continuously there in the land. Also, there has been a passion among Jewish people worldwide for centuries for their one and only homeland. Please remember that when the state of Israel was formed in 1948, its territory was about one 650th of the surrounding Arab and Muslim countries. Just to give you a perspective, the one homeland, every year at Passover, a holiday coming up soon, there is the, the prayer next year in Jerusalem, the hope that the Jewish people will be back in their homeland. Religious Jews pray several times a day for the regathering of exiles. There has been a longing. There has been a, a national identity associated with the land. The one and only world capital of the Jewish people has been Jerusalem through history. And there are psalms and poems that are written longing to be back there in the land. And remember, if, if, if you are, say, living in the Middle East, if you're a Muslim and you're situated, here's Jerusalem, here's Mecca, you pray with your back towards Jerusalem, you pray facing Mecca. Jews all around the world pray towards Jerusalem. I'm just saying it has had a special place in, in the Jewish heart and mind for millennia. It's also important to remember that there's no connection between modern Palestinians and ancient Philistines or Canaanites. There were certainly Arabs and Bedouins that have lived in that part of the world for centuries, if not millennia. And there are Palestinians who can trace back. They're living in the land for centuries. The great majority would be much more recent than that. But there is no connection, no, no, no ethnic or linguistic connection, no anthropological connection, no biological connection between those who would identify as modern Palestinians and the ancient Philistines or Canaanites. You'll sometimes hear that myth, but it's simply a myth. Also, what, what about the origin of the name Palestine? That name was given by an occupier. That name was given by Roman occupiers. After the Second Jewish Revolt in 132-135 of this era, as punishment for the Jews, the Roman emperor renamed the territory, the entire territory is Syria-Palestina. It was to mock the Jewish people and to mock their historic connection and to take the name Philistine and put it on it. So even the name Palestine is a derogatory name that was put on that region by Emperor Hadrian, himself an occupier. Also, let's remember that if you talked about the Palestinians before 1948, who identified by name as the Palestinians? Jews living in Palestine. Check out the Palestinian orchestra before 1948. It was not Arab, it was Jewish. There was not a national Arab identity associated with that region. It was considered to be part of larger Syria. Arab identity, the Muslim identity, carried out in very, very deep and rich ways in many other ways, but not in terms of a national Palestinian statehood. There was never an attempt to form a state there. And in fact, even the statehood concept came in much later in terms of that part of the world in the early 20th century, and somewhat under the influence of Woodrow Wilson. There's a newspaper, a famous newspaper in Israel today called the Jerusalem Post. You know what it was originally called? The Palestine Post, because Palestinians were Jews. And there was no such thing as Arab-Palestinian identity before 1967. There was no flag. There was no national consciousness. Now, let me say again, some people had lived there for generations and some for centuries. There's no denying that. But there was no concept of a Palestinian statehood or a Palestinian identity. Just check the history books. And those of you that can read Arabic, my, my Arabic's a little rusty, so those that can read it fluently, you'll do better than me or you'll read it quicker. Find me references to Palestinian national statehood concepts before 1948, or even explicitly expressed in those terms before 1967. Walid Shubat, who used to be a Palestinian terrorist and became a born-again Christian, 
he asked this question, why is it that on June 4th, 1967, I was a Jordanian, so right before the you know, Six Day War, and overnight, I became a Palestinian? He had one identity, and now there was a new identity that was being used. This is not an issue of should there be justice and fairness for the Palestinians. That's not the question. Of course there should be. This is not a question of do, do those who identify as Palestinians have a right to be there. That's not the issue. No one's talking about expelling people. God forbid. I'm simply talking about historical realities because what's often presented today is mythological. It is completely revisionist history. Now, Mahmoud Abbas, by the way, his doctoral dissertation, for those of you that don't know, was a denial of the Holocaust. This is the leader of the Palestinian Authority. Mahmoud Abbas recently claimed a 9,000-year Palestinian pedigree. He said, oh, Netanyahu, you are incidental in history. We are the people of history. We are the owners of history. So they have a 9,000-year pedigree there. That is simply historical fiction. Uh, the modern state of Israel, there were Arabs living in that part of the world in the late 1800s. There were Jews. The Arab population was larger. More Jews began to emigrate, began to develop the land in different ways, more Arabs began to come in as well. There were Arabs who were living there that were concerned about what would happen with Jews coming to, to live there. Was there enough room for everybody? Now, this is when you're just dealing with a few hundred thousand people. Now you've what, got like nine million people? So there's room. But what happened was anti-Semitism rising again in the late 1800s, pogroms, organized attacks on Jewish people, often by professing Christians in countries like Russia in the late 1800s, the Dreyfus Affair in France, and Jews began to realize there's Jew hatred around the world, and the only way we can get away from it is to have our own country. We cannot just expect to be accepted worldwide. Increase in Jewish and Arab immigration to the land begins to take place, and anti-Jewish intifadas sparked by Haj Amin al-Husseini in the 1920s and 1930s began to rise. It's important that you understand that prior to 1948, there were already intifadas taking place. There were already uprisings against the Jewish people, and they were not sparked by the majority of the people. They were sparked by radical Islamic elements among them. And they appealed to historic Islamic anti-Semitism. Through the centuries, Jews lived in Muslim lands and sometimes thrived. Sometimes Jews living in Muslim lands did better than Jews living in Christian lands. But let's also remember that the yellow star that Jews wore in the Holocaust was first something that they wore in Muslim countries. That they had the status of dhimmis, which is a, a, a second-class citizen status. Now here they are in the land of Israel, and Haj Amin al-Husseini, who became a colleague and comrade of Hitler, famous pictures of him together with Hitler, working together for the extermination of the Jews, prior to 1948, began to stir uprisings, resulting in many Jewish casualties. Now, there were some Jewish counterattacks, but if you're just counting numbers, they were minor in comparison. Any bloodshed, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Arab, however we identify, any bloodshed is bloodshed and is terrible. I acknowledge that. That's not the issue. I'm simply saying that before Israel was this alleged evil empire, occupier, there were violent demonstrations and attacks and murders of Jews stirred up by radical Islamic elements. The more you study about Haj Amin al-Husseini, the more disturbed you will become. Now what's interesting is Britain then was controlling that part of the world and it had been controlled different times, the Ottoman Empire, it had been under various Islamic leaders after the Crusades, it was controlled by, by the Catholic Church for some period of time. But now it's under British control, and whatever agreements were made, however the land was to be divided up, each time Jews agreed and Arabs didn't. It's just a historical reality. Historical reality. Now, the Holocaust. Haj Amin al-Husseini, again, a colleague of Hitler. Nazis were able to work with various Muslim leaders because of the historic Jew hatred found in radical Islam, or some would say mainstream Islamic thought. 
certainly going back to the days of conflict between Muhammad and the Jewish people. And, and listen, I have never written a book about Islamic anti-Semitism, but I have written a book about anti-Semitism in Jesus' name and church-sponsored anti-Semitism. I'm far more expert in that, and I'm ashamed, utterly ashamed of the history. What happened now, anti-Semitism rising in Germany, in Europe. Jews wanting to now get out of the country, but Britain and others limit the amount of Jews that can escape, the amount of Jews that can now emigrate or immigrate to Israel and make it their home, resulting in their slaughter in Europe. Let, let's please put this in context. If you have any issue with Jewish people or lack of love for Jewish people, then just make it your own people, your own ethnicity, whatever it is. Six million out of nine million Jews in Germany were slaughtered in cold blood. Two-thirds of the population. Take a country like Poland. 90% of Poland's 3.3 million Jews were slaughtered. Three million out of 3.3 million. In the Holocaust, one and a half million children and babies were slaughtered by the Nazis. Many times, Jews were made to dig large ditches. Then the fire was started in the ditch, then they would be shot and thrown into the ditch. But it became commonplace that for the Nazis to save a bullet, they would just throw the babies alive into the burning pits. And, and there are Jewish accounts just talking about how life ended at that point. Life had no meaning at that point when you see babies thrown alive into burning pits. This is the backdrop now, post-Holocaust. Can there be a homeland for the Jews? There is plenty of room for the Jews and the Arabs living together in the land. And the Jews were simply saying, if we could have a majority here, we could have our own country, but continually express the desire to be neighbors and to work side by side. Continually. Was there some Jewish terrorism? You bet rejected by the bulk of the nation? Was there some? Sure, but it was always the exception to the rule. And to this day, and this is well, well documented, but to this day, say during Operation Cast Lead, when terrorists were being bombed in Gaza, if there was a terrorist stronghold, and it was, it was in a, a populate, heavily populated area, much of Gaza being heavily populated, maybe there's a house they know is, a, is used for weaponry, they would actually, and this is documented, you can watch it, calls were made, calls were made to the house. We're about to bomb the house, get out. Tens of thousands of leaflets in Arabic dropped on the neighborhoods to say, we're going to be bombing here, evacuate. That's still the Israeli ethic for doing war. So finally, there's some world recognition that the Jewish people need a homeland, Hence, the formation of the modern state of Israel, decision made in 1948 and statehood, excuse me, in 47, statehood in 1948. Can I just say this plainly, and I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. If the Arabs living in the land had accepted that, then you would have already had your two-state solution in 1947, 1948. And my heart goes out very, very deeply to those who are identified today as Palestinians whether they are one generation in the land or 20 generations in the land, my heart goes out, and those here that would identify as Palestinians, too deeply because you have been used as pawns in a larger battle. And people have often not had your best interest in mind. Haj Amin al-Husseini, 1936. There is no place in Palestine for two races. The Jews left Palestine 2,000 years ago. Let them go to other parts of the world where there are wide, vacant places. David Ben-Gurion, 1937. We do not wish and do not need to expel Arabs and take their place. All our aspiration is built on the assumption, proven throughout all our activity in the land of Israel, that there is enough room in the country for ourselves and the Arabs. Every so often you'll read a David Ben-Gurion quote calling for expulsion and violence. They are bogus. They are bogus quotes. Any historian worth his salt will tell you they are bogus. 
This expresses the sentiment, fact. And let me just say this one little thing before I go on. As our daughters were growing up, they're now in their 30s, each with two kids, they would sometimes ask my wife, Nancy, we celebrate 36 years of marriage on Wednesday, they would sometimes ask her, Mom, how does this fit? Does this make me look fat? And she'd say, yeah. They said, Mom, why don't you tell me that? And she'd say, if you don't want my opinion, don't ask me, because I'm going to tell you the truth. Otherwise, I'll just tell you you look pretty, but if you, if you ask, I'm going to tell you the truth. So sometimes I'll ask her, I've just finished writing a book. Oh, it's a masterpiece. It's really good, I think. And I say, hon, could you read this? Would you mind reading this? Tell me what you think. And she'll say, oh, that's lousy. My masterpiece? She says, yeah. The way it starts, it's just bad. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're the writer. Figure it out. Well, I don't like that. I wanted to tell me it's wonderful. It's wow. That's, I can't believe I'm married to a man who writes like that. No, I don't expect that. But I want to hear something positive. But I've realized over the years that her loving, truthful statements help me a lot more than falsehoods. So if I'm saying something that stings, just ask one question. Is it accurate? Is it truthful? That's the only question. If this is all bogus, this is all nonsense, and, and, and everything I'm saying here is just created this afternoon on false websites, well, then let's expose it. If it's accurate, even if the truth hurts, take hold of it. Take hold of it. It's, it's, it's for you're good. Azam Pasha. October 11th, 1947, he was the Secretary General of the Arab League. This is an interview in Akbar al Yom newspaper. He said, it will be a war of annihilation. It will be a momentous massacre in history that will be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. This is what's going to happen to those Jews. This is October 11th, 1947. This is Golda Meir, who was Meyerson then, November 29th, 1947. So this is after the official announcement of, of, of the plan for statehood for Israel. She says, here, j just get this again, October 11th, 1947, an Arab leader, it will be a war of annihilation, it will be a momentous massacre in history that will be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. An Israeli leader, we are happy and ready for what lies ahead. Our hands are extended in peace to our neighbors. Both states can live in peace with one another and cooperate for the welfare of their inhabitants. That was the Israeli response to a two-state solution. The Jews did not refuse it. David Ben-Gurion, December 1947. If the Arab citizen will feel at home in our state, if the state will help him in a truthful and dedicated way to reach the economic, social, and cultural level of the Jewish community, then Arab distrust will accordingly subside and a bridge will be built to a Semitic Jewish Arab alliance. Haganah, this is Israeli Defense Force, April 1948. This is in the midst of war. This says the five surrounding Arab nations have attacked Israel. In its Arabic language broadcast and communications, the Haganah consistently articulated the same message. And I'm going to cite from Ephraim Karsh's very important book, Palestine Betrayed. On April 22nd, at the height of the fighting in Haifa, it distributed an Arabic language circular noting its ongoing campaign to clear the city of all criminal foreign bands so as to allow the restoration of peace and security and good neighborly relations among all of the town's inhabitants. We implore you again to keep your women, children, and the elderly from the dangerous places, read the circular. This is to the Arab population of Haifa. And to keep yourselves away from gang bases that are still subjected to our retaliatory action. We do not wish to shed the innocent blood of the city's peace loving inhabitants. On April 24th, another Haganah radio broadcast declared Arabs, we do not wish to harm you. Like you, we only want to live in peace. If the Jews and the Arabs cooperate, no power in the world will ever attack our country or ignore our rights. These were Jewish aspirations even in the midst of war. Jamal Husseini, speaking to the UN Security Council April 16, 1948, the representative of the Jewish agency told us yesterday that they were not the attackers, that the Arabs had begun the fighting. We did not deny this. We told the whole world that we were going to fight. This is historical truth. We'll get to the refugee crisis momentarily. 
but recently archives of documents, tens of thousands, I think it's actually millions of documents have been released in Arabic, in English, in Hebrew. And, and a scholar like Ephraim Karsh in Palestine and Trade quotes page after page after page after page of these things. It's easy to revise history 50, 60 years later. This is what was happening on the ground. The, the Nakba, the, the disaster, the catastrophe. How did this happen? As Israel celebrates its independence every year shortly after that, Palestinians and Arabs around the world mourn over the Nakba, the catastrophe. It was a catastrophe. Hundreds of thousands of, of Arabs living in Palestine lost their homes. Were they driven out or did they flee? Were they driven out or did they flee? Were they told that a cannon cannot distinguish between a Jew and an Arab, so get out of here, and once we destroy the Jews and drive them into the sea, you come back to their homeland. Is that what happened, or did they all flee because the evil Israelis went from town to town with ethnic cleansing to try to wipe them out? So uh, Middle East scholar Daniel Pipe summarizes the archival findings of Professor Ephraim Karsh in his new book, Palestine Betrayed. Far from being the hapless victims, of a predatory Zionist assault, it was Palestinian Arab leaders who from the early 1920s onward, and very much against the wishes of their own constituents, launched a relentless campaign to obliterate the Jewish national revival, which culminated in the violent attempt to abort the UN partition solution, which was a two-state solution or resolution. More broadly, Karsh observes, there was nothing inevitable about the Palestinian-Jewish confrontation, let alone the Arab-Israeli conflict. Why couldn't they live in peace and accept a two-state solution? Why not? To this day, Prime Minister Netanyahu says, we welcome a two-state solution. And to this day, it is renounced by Hamas and rejected by the Palestinian Authority. And by the way, there's a simple, indisputable truth that we'll get to in a little while that no one can deny. I mean, I'm enjoying watching the faces of those who are differing with me, like, oh, you've got to be kidding, this crazy. But thank you for doing it quietly. I respect that, because it can be frustrating. That's why I so much wanted to have a debate, so both sides could air things, and you could have someone up there championing your side, and then we could see where the truth is. But I'll say this plainly, one of us is wrong. Yes, justice needs to be done for everyone. Yes, there needs to be compassion on everyone. Yes. There are many, many difficulties there in the Middle East. Yes, Israel is far, 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 far from perfect. But one of us is representing truth and another error, or both are wrong, but both cannot be right in this telling of the story. Only with the passage of time did Palestinians and their Western supporters gradually rewrite their national narrative, thereby making Israel into the unique culprit, the one excoriated in the United Nations university classrooms and editorials. Carr successfully makes his case by establishing two main points. That one, the Jewish Zionist Israeli side perpetually sought to find a compromise, while the Palestinian Arab Muslim side rejected nearly all deals. And two, Arab intransigence and violence caused the self-inflicted catastrophe. In other words, the catastrophe was because of Arab leadership, Muslim leadership, not because of Jewish leadership. In the first years after 1917, Arab reaction was muted as leaders and masses alike recognize the benefits of the dynamic and Zionist enterprise that helped revive the backward, poor, and partially populated Palestine. Then emerged with British facilitation the noxious figure who would dominate Palestinian politics over the next three decades, Haj Amin al-Hussein. And if he's your champion, you're being championed by the wrong person. From about 1921 on, Karsh documents Zionists and Palestinians had many choices to make. While the former invariably opted for compromise, the latter relentlessly decided on extermination. In various capacities, Mufti, head of Islamic and political organizations, Hitler ally, hero of the Arab masses, Husseini drove his constituents to what Karsh calls a relentless collision course with the Zionist movement. Hating Jews so maniacally that he went on to join the Nazi genocide machine, Husseini refused to accept their presence in any numbers in Palestine, much less any form of Zionist sovereignty. From the early 1920s, then one witnessed a pattern still in place and familiar today. Zionist accommodation, painful concessions, and constructive efforts to bridge differences met by Palestinian anti-Semitism, rejectionism, and violence. Every piece of land that Israel has given back, it has paid dearly for. Gaza being a massive case in point. 
Despite the radicalization of Palestinian opinion by the Mufti and despite the Nazi rise to power, Zionists kept seeking an accommodation. It took some years, but the Mufti's zero-sum policy and eliminationism eventually convinced reluctant labor leaders, including David Ben-Gurion, that good works would not facilitate their dream of acceptance. Still, despite the repeated failures, they continued to search for a moderate Arab partner with whom to strike it. This dialectic culminated in November 1947 when the United Nations passed a partition plan that nowadays would be termed the two-state solution. In other words, it handed the Palestinians a state on a silver platter. Zionists rejoiced the Palestinian leaders, foremost the Malign Hussein, sadly rejected any solution that endorsed Jewish autonomy. Just ask yourself a question, 60 plus years ago, facts, not emotions, not what you want to believe or I want to believe, who rejected the UN partition and who accepted it? Who said, fine, there will be two peoples living in the land, and who said, no, there will not? Simple. They insisted on everything and so got nothing. Had they accepted the UN plan, Palestine would be celebrating its 62nd anniversary this May, and there would have been no Nakba. It's a fact. If you react emotionally to it, check your facts. Jesus said the truth will set you free. It remains a universal maxim. In some, Karsh explains it was the action of the Arab leaders that condemned hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to exile. That's why I say my heart goes out to Palestinians deeply. And as a Jew, that makes me a Semite that makes us of like blood, both descendant from Abraham through Isaac and through Ishmael. This unique kinship I feel with the Muslim world, in particular the Arab population, because of that. After the Arab flight, the Palestinian leadership disapproved of a population return, seeing this as implicitly recognized in the nascent state of Israel. The Israelis were at first ready to take back the evacuees, but then hardened their position as the war progressed. So as there were concerted efforts to exterminate the Jews, finally they said, okay, you're not coming back. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion explained their thinking on June 16, 1948. This will be a war of life and death, and the evacuees must not be able to return to the abandoned places. We did not start the war. They made the war. Jaffa waged war on us. Haifa waged war on us. Basin waged war on us. And I do not want them again to make war. Tale of two refugee peoples. About 800,000 Jewish refugees had to flee their homes and countries when Israel was reestablished in 1948. Some have been living in these countries for centuries upon centuries, but they had to flee because of the war and hostility in the Arab Muslim world against the Jews. About 600,000 Arab refugees fled the newly formed state, waiting for their Arab brethren to drive the Jews into the sea. Well, it didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. And it's not because Israel is perfect and God is only blessing Israel. I'm simply giving you historical, factual realities. Okay, so hang on. 800,000 Jewish refugees had to flee their homes and countries. When Israel was reestablished in 1948, about 600,000 Arab refugees fled the newly formed state, waiting for their Arab brethren to drive the Jews into the sea. Well, what happened to these two refugee groups? The newly formed Jewish state successfully incorporated its refugees. They fled there, and the vast majority were resettled there. The surrounding Arab nations did not, quite intentionally, produce the crisis of the displaced Palestinian people a crisis that remains to this day. Why weren't the refugees successfully absorbed in the surrounding Arab nations? Were they being used as pawns, political pawns, against Israel? It's expressed more than 20 years ago by Ralph Galloway, former head of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency of Palestinian Refugees. The Arab states do not want to solve the refugee problem. They want to keep it as an open sore, as an affront to the United Nations, and as a weapon against Israel. Hang on. I said I was going to give you one indisputable piece of information that's current. I mean, everything is indisputable if you'll check the sources accurately enough. But hang on. The Arabs who did stay in the land now number more than one and a half million. They have full rights as citizens and even serve in the Knesset. And they have more freedoms of speech and religion than any other Arabs in the Middle East. Israeli Arabs make up 20%, roughly, of the population. Even in 1948, they were part of the Knesset. They could get up and publicly blast Israel. They could call it an apartheid state, and they remain citizens. Just answer me this question. 
Please tell me a surrounding Arab nation, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, where the population can get up, 20% of the population, and blast the government and speak against it and will not be attacked, will not be thrown in prison, will not be tortured. Just, just tell me where that happens freely, where Palestinian journalists say, upset with Hamas or Palestinian Authority leadership, can freely and openly criticize the government. You know how, you know how much Israelis criticize their own government? Do you understand there are Israeli professors teaching in Israeli universities calling for the boycott of Israeli universities? This dialogue goes on all the time within Israel. You'll never find the more self-critical people. You, you could build a better case for Palestinians by going to critical Israeli sources than Arab sources. 1.5 million, those are the ones who stayed and they were welcomed as fellow citizens, and they are fellow citizens to this day. Along with this, many Israeli Jews are critical of their government, as I said, constantly calling for the investigation of alleged human rights violations by their own people. Where's the equivalent of this in the West Bank and Gaza, and what kind of rights would Jews have in a Palestinian state? Please tell me that if there was a two-state solution right now, let's say everyone could agree to it, let's say everybody's equally at fault, all right, and now everybody agrees to it, would Jews be allowed to serve in the government of the Palestinian Authority in the equivalent of a Knesset? Would they be allowed to criticize the government the way Israelis, Arabs are, and, and get up in the Knesset and give a speech blasting the prime minister? Would they be able to do that? Interesting. This evil, wicked, occupying apartheid state gives these equal rights to us Israeli Arab citizens. There's an Israeli TV show. Go, on, go online, look for it. It's called What Would You Do? And, and this just aired recently. What they do is they have actors going into different places and they're being filmed, but nobody knows they're actors. So a woman in Arab dress goes into, traditional Arab dress, goes into a convenience store at a gas station in Israel while they're serving coffee to people. And she says, then, you, then you've got an Arab man goes in there. They, you just you watch it, watch the reactions. They go in there to the coffee shop. I just wasn't set up for a video presentation tonight, so go online and watch these things. The woman says, the Arab woman, I want a cup of coffee. And the guy behind the counter says, we don't serve Arabs. She says, what? She says, we don't serve Arabs. She says, what do you mean? I'm a human, but we don't serve Arabs. Look at it, we don't serve Arabs. You watch, person after person, the Israeli outrage. You, you watch it. This is not staged. What do you mean? You don't serve Arabs? I don't go here anymore. One after, I'll buy her the coffee then. I'm paying for the coffee. You don't serve her, you don't, we leave. Interesting. Could it be that there is a demonizing of Israel and the Jewish people? Could it be that we're not looking at the larger picture and the larger history? Could that be? Other regional conflicts today, it's ludicrous to think that without the presence of Israel in the Middle East, all would be well. There's been revolution and war and chaos in a number of the surrounding nations the last two years. The uprisings in Egypt, the uprising now in Syria, the uprising in Libya, in Yemen, in Tunisia. Is that because of evil Israel? Is that because of the Jewish occupiers? They often get blamed for every conflict in the land. You look and think, okay, there's more going on here. And there have been constant disputes between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Is that true or not? It's not Israel's fault. 1980, Abd al-Hamid Haddam, then Syria's foreign minister, admitted if we look at a map of the Arab homeland, we can hardly find two countries without conflict. We can hardly find two countries which are not either in a state of war or on the road to war. That's not the fault of Israel. There's a saying, if you have two Jews in a room, you have three opinions. Again, I'm not glorifying Jews, okay? I'm simply saying that to blame Israel for all the conflicts in the Middle East, it's, it's all the fault of Israel, is ridiculous and false. Israel being demonized, I'm almost through and then we'll have a time for, for questions. You've got to look at the lies of historic anti-Semitism. 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council of the Catholic Church decreed officially that at communion, the Eucharist, that the wafer and the wine or the wafer and the juice were literally the body and blood of Jesus. So rumors started that Jews were kidnapping and torturing a wafer. 
because this was their way of getting back at Jesus. Thousands upon thousands of Jews were slaughtered by the Catholic Church over that accusation. And during the Black Plague, Jews died like everybody else, but not in quite as large numbers. Some of it just having to do with Jewish dietary laws and, and hygiene. So when you scapegoat, who caused the Black Plague that wiped out such a large amount of the population of Europe? It's the Jews. They poisoned the wells. They used a mixture of animal parts, meaning parts, and sacred elements of the Eucharist and poisoned the wells. All these historic lies told about the Jewish people. There were no Jews in the World Trade Center 9-11. And it was Israel that brought the towers down. I had quite a number of cab drivers in New York City tell that to me. I guess they didn't go to the funerals of, of folks like my brother-in-law killed 9-11. Oh, Jewish, by the way. And so many others. I wonder if there are any lies circulating today. Oh, the protocols of the elders of Zion, a notorious forgery by the Russian secret police about 100 years old, that purports to tell the story of world Jewish domination plans. That there are 300 Jewish leaders all around the world, the secret cabal of Jewish leaders, who are waiting for the right moment to take over the world. This remains, you check this out. Those of you that travel in and out of Islamic nations, Arab nations, check out to see if this remains a bestseller. Check out to see if this has been serialized on Egyptian television. Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Oh, by the way, here's how the plot culminates. The Jews will bring the entire world into subjection to the Hindu god Vishnu. That's, that's part of the protocols. People believe this. Go to Tahrir Square in, in Egypt and go to the bookstores nearby and see if they're selling this. Check it out. It is widely believed to be true. Could it be that there is a demonizing of the Jewish people to this day? You know, in the Middle Ages, and probably beyond that, it was believed that the reason that Jewish men wore head covering was to cover the horns. 1951, Mohammed Nimr Khatib. We are fighting an organized, educated, cunning, devious, and evil people, speaking of the Jews, that has concentrated the world's wealth and power in its hands. 1951. We are fighting the forces that have prevailed over the entire world. We are fighting the power that buried Hitler and defeated Japan. We are fighting world Zionism that has Truman in its pay, enslaves Churchill and Attlee, and colonizes London, New York, and Washington. Interesting. Still being believed to this day. The Jews control all the money in the world. The Jews control all the politics. The Jews control all the money. Interesting. One side still welcomes two states. Recent polling of Palestinian opinion reveals that the strong majority do not want a Jewish state in their region. Most recent polling I've seen within the last couple of months. Now, I'm sure there are certain Jewish factions in Israel that don't want a two-state solution. But everybody's tired of war. As I said at the outset, you think Israeli parents enjoy sending their sons and daughters into war? Sending them into battle? You think they enjoy that? Everyone mandatory military service? I don't know what gas costs in other parts of the world. It's about eight, nine dollars a gallon now in Israel. Tax about 45 percent. You, you think the population enjoys spending so much of its budget on defense? People are tired. Oh yeah, there's Arab hatred in Israel. There's Jew hatred in the Palestinian territories. You're going to have some of that everywhere. Human beings in their worst side. But Prime Minister Netanyahu has publicly said in front of the U.S. Congress, "I accept a two-state solution." Obviously, their details, their size are going to differ on. He said that he's asked Mahmoud Abbas, because they won't deal with Hamas, won't negotiate with Hamas as a terrorist organization. Would you publicly acknowledge your acceptance of a Jewish state? Would you just publicly acknowledge that? No. And it remains the Hamas charter that Israel should be exterminated. Palestinian Authority still has not openly pledged its full acceptance of the Jewish state. Hamas remains committed to the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. These are the negotiating partners that Israel is dealing with right now. Golda Meir, 1957. Peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. What do you think of that? 
Peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. Is it possible that a Jew hatred, a hatred of the so-called evil occupier, drives people beyond even a sense of what's in the best interest of the future generations? Again, to give you a, a feel of the Israeli heart, this is Golda Meir, a press conference in London in 1969. When peace comes, we will perhaps in time be able to forgive the Arabs for killing our sons, but it will be harder for us to forgive them for having forced us to kill their sons. In other words, worse than our sons being killed is the fact that, that we killed theirs. Interesting that she would say that. I'd like to hear parallel statements from those on the other side of the table. Statement by Prime Minister Netanyahu, I believe to be true. The truth is that if Israel were to put down its arms, there'd be no more Israel. If the Arabs were to put down their arms, there'd be no more war. There's no question that you could have people come up here and talk about harsh treatment by Israeli soldiers, of, of someone stopped at a checkpoint that couldn't get to a hospital and a child died. There's no question you'll have those stories. And there's no question that Israel's been guilty of many things. There's no question. But, but I also want you to know that when there are reports of an Israeli bomb killing Palestinian civilians and women and children, there's outcry in Israel. There have been public demonstrations drawing hundreds of thousands of Israelis to protest the action. Calls for government investigations of cruelty by soldiers. Whereas when a bus with children is blown up by Palestinian terrorists, there's dancing in the streets and distributing of candy. Something's wrong with that picture if this is allegedly about peace. So I ask again, where are the protests over all the thousands of Israelis killed and wounded during the intifadas? Where is the campus outrage over the recent brutal terrorist attacks? And as we said a year ago, family in their sleep in cold blood, sliced up, down to a three-month-old. Until there's a recognition that Israel is not the evil occupier, until there is a recognition that this apartheid state statement is a myth, until there's a recognition that the reason Israel has put up a security wall is to keep murderers out, murderers, just like you would in your home or your backyard. Until there's a recognition of that, there will not be peace, there will not be harmony. So here's what I'm asking you to do. It's easy to just mock what I say, and it's easy to just accept it all. Check it out. Investigate. One thing I, I learned in my doctoral studies, and, and even before that, everything I did was text-based. Everything I did was based on the, the original languages and documents. I'm really not concerned about someone else's opinion, either way. I'm really not concerned about some sentimental attachment, either way. I, I want to know truth. I, I want to know what the, the facts are on the ground. And, and I have friends, for example, Messianic Jews in Israel, that are constantly working with Arab pastors. I, I have friends that at a recent youth conference with 900 young people in Israel, Jews who believe in Jesus, they brought in, in particular, they, they were able to bring in a whole bunch of, of young people from the different parts, whether it was West Bank or Gaza, I forget where they, where they were brought in from, 70 kids, I forget the exact number. They were treated like heroes by the other Jews. Their worship band led, and, and they were given special honor and treatment. There's, there is love and compassion and recognition and a desire to see reconciliation wherever it can come. But one side is going to have to say, we are not trying to kill you, we are not trying to wipe you out, we are not trying to murder you, we are not trying to exterminate you. We recognize your right to be here. Now let's try to work out our differences. When that happens, and not before, there will be peace. And ultimately, the lasting peace we're looking for is something we're going to have to pray for and look for the Lord's gracious intervention 
In that sense, what Jews are looking for, the coming of the Messiah and Christians, the return of the Messiah in the Islamic world in its own end time expectation, I just want you to know that ultimately we need Jesus to come back to establish lasting peace, but we can do a whole lot better than we're doing right now. All right, thank you for listening so attentively, especially those that differ with me. Thank you for not getting up, storming out, because it can be frustrating. Uh, I want to take uh, questions now. And how are we going to do that, Stephanie?